Um, the mission at Climate First is to do the right thing for the planet, people, community, and our shareholders. The team is thrilled to be sponsoring this inspiring event. Empowering voters and defending democracy is more important than ever before. The bank offers a range of products. You can speak to them today about how you can use your finances as a force for good and the impact of voting with your wallet. Climate First President Lex Ford and team, please stand. Um, at this point, I would like to um, ask all of our government office holders, newly elected officials, and if there's anyone in the room who's already on top of it and has filed for something for our next election, please come on down to the microphone over there. Um, please introduce yourselves. Um, I will ask you once again, regardless of the fact, all the way down, gentlemen. Regardless of the fact we love them all for their service, please hold your applause until the end. Gentlemen. Good morning, or good afternoon. I'm Todd Weaver. I'm vice mayor of Winter Park. Hello, I'm Marty Sullivan, Commissioner for the City of Winter Park. Now, I've been a member of the League for a long time. Now I'm going to put on my League hat. We have a petition signing over here for a Florida constitutional amendment for right to clean water. I ask you, please, take a look and take the minute or two over at the table at the far end to sign a petition. We need to do that to get it before the Florida Supreme Court to approve this and get it forward to the voters. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Amy Mercado, the Orange County property appraiser. Good morning. I'm Karen Castro Dental, a school board member, District 6, and I want to thank you all for working so hard to register so many students in our schools. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Carmen Torres, and I'm running for Senate District 25, which is all of Osceola County and the southwest section of Orange. Thank you. All right, good morning, my name is Andrew Bain. I'm um, Orange County Judge. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to be here and look forward to speaking with all of you soon. Okay, um, before I introduce our panel, I'm going to take a moment for a point of personal privilege um, and I want to let you all know that today is the grand finale of Gloria Picard's tenure as chair of the Hot Topics Committee. Um, I can personally attest this is a big job. Um, I don't think it, the only thing harder would have been to produce, I don't know, the Ten Commandments movie back in the 50s. And um, it takes a village and she has a great team with her. But Gloria also knows how to uh, motivate and organize a team. And that's what it took to bring us back to this venue and all the improvements that you've seen. So I just want to thank her. Um, she has given so much service to the league between her co-presidency and this. And we do have a new chair. Um, she will be formalized by the board next week. But Susan Windmiller has graciously 
decided to step up and accept the position. And she would not like it if I didn't mention the fact that she is looking for a co-chair. So, <laughs> um, please speak to Susan after the event if you're uh, willing to take it on. Let me tell you, it's a lot easier when there are two of you. It'll be a breeze. You two, it won't be hard at all. It's harder when you're alone. Um, so now, um, the League of Women Voters mission is empowering voters, defending and defending democracy. Recently, we've been asking about the state of democracy in Florida and what that means for our future and that of our children and grandchildren. According to recent polls, most Americans, Republicans, Democrats, and independents believe that our democracy is in trouble. Many call it a full-blown crisis. The nonprofit End Citizens United dedicated to fixing our democracy by getting big money out of politics and protecting our right to vote has scored democracy in every state. Florida, I am sorry to report, has an overall grade of D, and they summarize. Florida has one of the weaker democracies in the country, and they go on to say, in the wake of the 2020 election, Florida has taken several steps to make the state more vulnerable to democracy subversion. For these acts, Florida sco scored a flat out F. <laughs> Today, our experts will examine the state of democracy in Florida, and in particular, what does history tell us about how democracies become autocracies? What has happened in Florida to weaken our democracy? Can we expect the courts to protect the Florida Constitution as it has been construed by prior courts? What citizen rights are being and have been whittled away? What is the role of our league to defend democracy? I'd like to introduce our moderator of a most distinguished panel. Um, our moderator today is the Honorable Frederick Lauten, who currently works as a mediator and arbitrator at the firm of Upchurch, Watson, White, and Max. He joined the firm in January 2020. He served as Chief Judge of the Ninth Judicial Circuit from 2014 to 2019. Judge Loughton served on the bench for 26 years. Please join me to welcome Judge Loughton to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I want to introduce our panelists to you. I want to start by saying that I probably can't overstate how thrilled I am to invite Tali Diphold to, the, uh, to her chair. Tali is the CEO of the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center of Florida. Um, you know that song that had the line, who's the blonde stranger who entered my life? Uh, there's this blonde stranger back in my house now that Tali is the permanent uh, full-time CEO of the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center in Florida, so I'm thrilled that she's joining us today. Tali is a respected voice and has extensive leadership experience in the field of Holocaust education. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of New Hampshire and a master's in Holocaust and Genocide Studies from Gratz College, where she graduated as valedictorian and received the Philip Solomon Prize for Holocaust Studies. Would you join me in welcoming Holly, Tali Dipper? Our next participant is a great friend and, and an amazing Central Floridian, the Honorable Charles T. Wells, who assumed his duties as Justice of the Florida Supreme Court on June 16th, 1994, after being appointed by then Governor Lawton Childs. Justice Wells became Chief Justice in July of 2000 and served uh, in that position through June of 2002. There was a little event that happened during that stretch of time called Bush versus Gore. Some of you might remember that. He was the Chief Justice of the Court 
during that challenging case. Uh, Justice Wells has been a lawyer in Orlando, in Orange County, for 60 years, and he's born and raised in Orlando. Join me in welcoming Justice Wells. Jason Garcia is one of Florida's leading investigative journalists and the publisher of Seeking Rents, a newsletter and podcast that explores the ways, ways businesses influence public policy in our state. Mr. Garcia previously worked for the Orlando Sentinel. Would you please join me in welcoming Jason Garcia. Dr. Fernando Rivera is a professor of sociology and the director of the Puerto Rican Research Hub at the University of Central Florida. He earned his MA and PhD in sociology from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and his BA degree in sociology from the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Rivera? Tali, I'm going to start with you. You've spent a lifetime studying the Holocaust and the rise of Nazism in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s. When Hitler came to power, Germany was a republic with a constitution under the Weimar Republic. I know it's a lot to ask of you in five minutes <laughs> worth of time, but can you give us a brief historical overview of the background in Germany and its loss of democracy under a constitutional government that occurred in the 1920s and the 1930s. I'm going to turn the floor. Absolutely. Over. Please don't start the timer yet. I just want to say I'm honored to be here. And this is a semester long class in five minutes. So I'm standing and I'm going to be speaking very fast. But um, I really believe that this overview is really critical. So thank you. OK, we've all heard the phrase, history doesn't repeat itself, but it definitely does rhyme. And so in order to explore the fall of democracy, I find it helpful to look back at the creation of democracy in one country, Germany, starting in 1914. So brief overview. So the First World War, 1914 to 1918, Germany at that time was run by a Kaiser, an emperor. The German people like this form of government. They love their military tradition. However, two days before the war ended, the Kaiser ran away into exile. The new government that was created was the Weimar Republic, and it started in 1918. The first president was Frederick Ebert. He helped craft the Constitution. And two things of significance here. We're doing the, the fast pace. Article 48 of the Constitution allowed the president to rule by decree in an emergency. The president could make any decisions and laws without having to ask the Reichstag to vote. The president could rule as a dictator. So we're starting to already lay the foundation here that we know was later abused. And the proportional representation. The voting system was very fair and modern. A party gets a number of seats directly proportional to the percentage of votes it receives. So if your party received 12% of the vote, you were allotted 12% of seats in the Reichstag. This meant that lots of parties got seats, but no party ever got over 50% of the voters and no government ever had the majority, so decisions needed to be made based on agreement, of which we all know didn't happen. So what the effects of World War I on Germany? The political effects. All that was left of the government were the original Reichstag parties that had previously not had real power or experience running the government. The physical and financial effects. The farming had been disrupted by the war, and by 1918, Germany was producing half the milk and 60% of the meat that it needed. Germany had borrowed money to pay for the war and was effectively, at this point, bankrupt. And on top of that, the stab in the back mentality. Because the army signed the surrender, people started to say that it was actually the new government, the Weimar Republic, that was to blame. They couldn't understand why they lost the war, and this became the, back in, the stab in the back philosophy. The psychological effects are hard to undermine. Germany had been a proud, ambitious country, had worked hard and made sacrifices during the war. Throughout the war, they were assured by the leaders that Germany would win. Losing was devastating to the pride of many Germans, and they needed someone to blame. They looked for someone to blame in their new position of political weakness. All of these factors meant that the new German government, came to be known as, the, we know, the Weimar Republic, started off from a point of severe weakness. 
Citizens were not in support of the system, and they were held a lot of blame against Germany for losing the war. Enter the Treaty of Versailles, 1919. And those effects of this treaty were felt well into the 1930s. The peace agreement was forced onto Germany, and the way that we remember this, and I teach it to my students, is lamb. This is what it cost. The land, the army, the money, and the blame. Germany lost 13% of its land, 10% of its industry, 15% of its agriculture. In fact, it lost West Prussia, which became called the Polish Corridor, which was given to Poland, which was instrumental in the breakout of World War II. The army, the pride and joy of uh, Germany, was reduced to 100,000 men. No air force. The navy was limited to six battleships and became a major source of humiliation. Germany was no longer a strong country to be feared. In fact, it was seen as weak. Loss of pride, humiliation, and millions of soldiers out of work. Money. Germany was ordered to pay Britain, France, and the US six billion in reparations in annual installments. This to a almost uh, bankrupt Germany at the time meant no chance of ever meeting those payments. And the blame, once again, cannot be understated. Germany was required to accept complete blame for starting World War I. They felt that the Treaty of Versailles had been forced on them by the evil allies and by their own weak politicians. At this point, many groups tried to overthrow the Weimar Republic in its early life. Everyone from political extremists, communists, fascists, and 1923 marks a year of crisis. Germany's in a financial crisis, inflation is becoming a huge problem, and countries did not want to lend Germany money. So the Weimar government printed money. It printed it at such a rate that it quickly became worthless. In February 1923, you needed 7,000 marks to buy $1. By November of 1923, you needed 130 million marks to buy $1. Billion marks, billion mark notes were printed. People stopped using money as it was worthless. Workers would rush to stores after getting paid because the prices would rise by the hour. And a billion marks was barely enough to buy a loaf of bread. So what are the effects of this hyperinflation? We really can't compare when we hear inflation. The workers lost their faith in government. The middle class started to support extreme parties. This is where we see that people in desperate situations really gravitate to extreme parties. And hatred of minorities and of Jews. We needed a scapegoat. They needed a scapegoat to blame. And the wealthy labeled the government as incompetent. Then we see the event that's called the Munich Push, where people blame the Weimar government for their problems. And Hitler, at the time, quite an unknown, seized the opportunity to try and overthrow the government. Of course, that didn't work, but that was the event that started the Nazi uh, party on their rise to power. That was in 1923. Anyone at this point that was labeled elderly, which we'll just say was over 55 at the time, lost all their pensions and their savings became completely worthless. So enter 1923. We're going to take a tiny moment to talk about some moments of bliss. It's the recovery from the crisis. Gustav Stressman was made the chancellor of Germany in 1923, and he set out to solve Germany's problems. How did he address this? Hyperinflation immediately stopped printing money. It stopped overnight. He got rid of the old currency, he increased confidence in the system, and the new currency came into being, even though it was not ever fully stable. The economy. He took a huge loan from the US, called the Dawes Plan. It was a huge injection of money that helped people and allowed Germany to reinvest in industry. Production improved, and the US had a stipulation, little asterisk, they could call back the loan at any time. Even during this period, unemployment still remained a huge problem. And reparations were restructured so that less money was paid each year, but it was paid for a longer period. And that was not paid fully until the 1980s. So we enter the golden age of the Weimar Republic, 1924 to 1929. This period's very carefully studied. Germany became stabilized. People were less likely to support extreme parties like the Nazis. Politics became stabilized. We saw fewer elections. 
The votes for Nazi and communist parties went way down. And Straussman's changes and the Dawes, uh, Dawes plan led to stability. Germany became a leading exporter in the world of manufactured goods for a very short period of time. But in 1925, Hindenburg was elected president and everybody knew at the time he was openly, wow, okay. That's the quick, quick, quick <laughs> preview. I'm sorry, I, I ran knew, out of time. I knew time. that was a challenge. Sorry, you have to sign up. That was the Cliff Notes version. A decade of history in five minutes. Um, Tali, here's my opening question. Yeah. So, I think democracies always have challenges. Any government system has challenges. Our theme today is threats to democracy. I think we should differentiate between challenges to democracy and threats to democracy. Is, in your opinion, having studied this, is what happened in the 30s in Germany, is it unique and unlikely to be repeated, or are there lessons that we can learn about how fragile a democracy is and what we have to do to safeguard democracy uh, in our time, which is different, of course, from the 20s and the 30s? Absolutely. So as I started off, we, we don't learn from history in general. That's one of the things that we've come to understand. I've dedicated my life to studying this period because all four of my grandparents were Holocaust survivors, and I wanted to understand the phrase, never again. I didn't believe that phrase at that time. There were genocides before the Holocaust and after the Holocaust. So what we learned and the lessons are so critical, not because we want to teach specifically what happened. So it's not critical that I didn't get past that 1930s and the 40s. What's critical to understand is that people in desperate situations, people who do not feel heard, when people cannot feed their families and when they feel a lot of fear and internal conflict, they turn to extreme measures. So all of the lessons that we learned from history, all of them can and should be applied to current times. And as a child of immigrants, the real challenge and the real understanding of the fragility of democracy is how to encourage people to participate in democracy. The understanding that democracy is not guaranteed. In this country, we've become very complacent. We don't vote because we understand, many of us, we do, but many of us don't. We don't feel that we have an ability to affect change. And the lessons of the past show that we indeed do, that democracy is very fragile, and that things can turn south in a very fast manner. But with participatory democracy, and the number one most critical area is education. And that's what we're dedicated to doing. Education is the most critical to understand the patterns and to stop them before they manage to take hold. So, Justice Wells, one of the issues, one of the factors I read about that period of time was that judges under the Weimar Republic were, took an oath to the constitution of the, of the government. When Hitler came to power, he made judges take an oath to him, him personally. Uh, and so some people have questioned, how can you lose a democracy under a constitutional government with the court system? That happened in, in the rise to Nazi Germany. Uh, I want to ask you some questions about our current court system. Um, I know that at time, members of the Florida legislature have expressed on the floor of the chamber that maybe a particular bill could violate either the United States or Florida Constitution, but let's pass it anyway and let the courts tell us whether it's constitutional or not. And so now we face a number of issues, uh, either that the Florida Supreme Court or the federal district courts have to address pertaining to legislation coming out of the Florida legislature. And I wonder if you would address that situation overall in terms of the challenges to legislation that the courts are going to face. And in particular, if you could spend some time addressing the April legislation banning abortion after 15 weeks except for fatal fetal abnormal abnormalities or threatening the life of the mother with having been confirmed in writing by two doctors uh, with no exceptions for rape, incest, or human trafficking. And the fact that Florida's Constitution has a privacy clause and how that might affect that, the upcoming abortion decision. So the floor is yours. Okay. I think that the, the thing first in answer to your question, Judge Lawton, is that we have to have a glare as legal women voters, as citizens in Florida upon the courts. And we have to require, we, one of the things that, that is true in Florida is that judges are subject to uh, elections. 
but more importantly, they're subject to public opinion. And we've got to expect our judges to adhere to the Constitution because there is nothing that is more central to our form of government in this state and in this country than the fact that we are underwritten by a written Constitution. And the Constitution guarantees individual rights. And one of the, the, the things that is presently under pressure is whether the other two branches of the government are going to respect individual rights. And uh, the abortion issue, to me, is a prime example of that. Because one of the things that uh, is that the Florida Supreme Court ruled in 1987 that the privacy provision of the Florida Constitution reaches abortion and that there cannot be a legislative infringement of the right to abortion under the Florida Constitution. That was reiterated in 2007 by the fact that there was an attempt to place in the Constitution a ban to abortion, but that that failed. So we are in a democracy in Florida, which we have to insist is respected. I think my time is expired. Um, Justice Wells, before I, I move on, let me, confidence in the U.S. Supreme Court may be at its lowest. Some recent polls said about 25% of the population is confident in the integrity of the United States Supreme Court, down from 36% a year before that, and, and at an all-time low, before that, the lowest approval rating was 30%. It's kind of scary that it's under 50%. In part, that had, had to do um, with the reversal of Roe v. Wade. If the Florida Supreme Court were to write an opinion that reversed its precedent in the abortion area, no judge, appellate judge, has ever lost a merit retention election. Maybe you can tell the audience a little bit about merit retention and whether really we have a state where we could ever recall judges uh, at the appellate level who depart from precedents. Well, Florida went in 1970 to a merit retention type of judge uh, for appellate judges. In this circuit, every circuit in Florida, of which there are 20 circuit judges, have to run for re-election. Appellate judges do not. But it has worked pretty well in Florida since the 1970s to have the pressure of retention on the appellate bench because we had a problem with some scandals in the 1970s in Florida, but since then we have uh, what appears to me to be a fairly respected appellate court bench. But we are dependent upon the, the appellate judges because they are the first line of enforcement as to the state constitution. So it's incumbent upon all of us, and especially groups like the, this league, to keep the pressure on the appellate courts to follow the United States Constitution and the Florida Constitution. Thank you, Justice Wells. Jason, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that democracy uh, becomes a government of bullies tempered by editors and reporters. Um, <laughs> there, seems, there seems to have been a sustained effort to weaken independent news organizations, cl uh, close off access to public records, uh, that the, uh, and hide government business from the voters. Um, and in 2016, we know that the president at the time declared any unfavorable news report to be fake news. Uh, talk to us about democracy and the importance of reporters, the media. Maybe you can talk to us a little bit about what media is today and whether it's threatened both economically and politically in its current shape. Yeah, that's a, obviously a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Um, let me start with the last one about whether or not it's under attack because it is and it's a systematic, very deliberative attack. So I'll give you just like one example recently because I came across this as I was going through some records. But um, I don't know if folks in here are aware of, but for the last few years, the Florida legislature had taken aim at legal notices, which for 
many, many years, local governments had been required to publish in newspapers. It was just sort of a general good government transparency thing, but it also became sort of an important sort of revenue source for newspapers, particularly small newspapers like pla in newspapers in places like Quincy, Florida, right? The legislature for a number of years now has been taking aim at trying to eliminate that requirement to weaken newspapers. What we found out about that is that uh, the governor was personally sort of directing this effort, Governor DeSantis, as a way to weaken newspapers. Um, in fact, uh, two years ago, the newspapers thought they had struck a, a deal where they agreed to create a publicly available joint website where they would publish, uh, publish legal notices free of charge. So to try and get around this idea that this was about making, uh, you know, not, not forcing people to buy a newspaper to see this stuff. So they struck this agreement. The day that agreement was uh, was signed, or that the amendment codifying that agreement was filed, there's uh, communications from the governor's office where they're talking about, we're gonna come back next year and get rid of it entirely, right? So they have very clearly been going after this. At the same time, we have seen a proliferation um, in Florida of these sort of propaganda sites masquerading as legitimate news. This is kind of like, what we've seen on the, the federal level or a national level with like OI, OAN and, and those kinds of sort of right wing and to far lesser extent on the far left wing as well. These, these sites that um, pretend to be legitimate news organizations but really are just sort of propaganda outlets. And we started to see those develop in Florida. And again, this isn't happening by accident. It's being deliberately sort of stoked and coordinated by folks in power. I'll give you another example that we uh, just came up, came across is, uh, you know, some of the folks in here might remember that uh, Governor Ron DeSantis suspended Andrew Warren, the prosecutor, uh, the independently elected state attorney in Hillsborough. You know, that uh, is as much a public relations battle as is anything, right? It's a, po it's a political issue as much as anything. Um, we have seen the, the governor's office, senior staff in the governor's office, coach one of these, these new sites that they are trying to prop up on how to make a public records request to pull out documents from Andrew Warren's office to then coach them how to use those in a story that is critical of Andrew Warren and then share those stories with other legitimate reporters saying like, oh my God, did you see this story? You know, and it's all designed to create this sort of appearance of legitimate news out there, this echo chamber that sort of takes these things and legitimizes them. And, and there's two things happening. You're trying, to, you're trying to weaken independent media and you are trying to stand up and obfuscate partisan media. Um, you know, there was some criticism in 2016 that Donald Trump got more free publicity from the media during, because he was outrageous that other candidates had to pay for. And I'm wondering, you know, that in part incorporates my question of what is media anymore? What's your response to him getting so much free publicity by just being outrageous and, and the media's obligation and responsibility in that arena? Yeah, I think that's an incredibly valid criticism of, of the way, particularly the national media handled um, Donald Trump. And I think it's, it's the exact sort of thing you see Governor DeSantis, who is, you know, presents himself as sort of Trumpism with competence, right? He sort of tries to, to sort of use that same idea, right? This is why you do things like the, the Stop Woke Act, which is just an attempt already declared unconstitutional to restrict the, the way people can talk about race in universities and in, and in private companies, right? All of these um, are, less about, uh, are less about actually achieving any sort of substantive policy than they are about sort of stoking some sort of outrage, including like outrage on the left that gets covered and just this noise. And that is good for a politician who is trying to climb the ranks by sort of being seen as taking on the enemies of his perceived outgroup, you know, his folks, the people they perceive as the outgroup. And so I think the media, and I, and I include myself, part of, part of my sort of mission is I focus really hard on economic issues because I think a lot of this is designed to distract from the economic policies that are being passed in Florida. But the media needs to be really cognizant of not just covering the things that, um, the governor or prominent politicians or presidential candidates want you to cover because so much of it is designed to do, to replicate the Trump effect of all publicity is good publicity and when there's so much volume, it becomes very hard for folks to figure out what is really important. Uh, I'm gonna ask Dr. Rivera a question, but Jason, I wanna invite you into this conversation, but let me pose the question to Dr. Rivera. There's always been a degree of income inequality in the United States, whether due to market forces or discriminatory laws and practices. How does Florida fare in terms of policies that foster income inequality? Can, and can we have a truly functioning democracy if there is extreme income inequality in our society? And 
Uh, doctor, I'm going to have you start, and then Jason, if you want to kick in on that one, please feel free. No, first of all, thank you for having me and, 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 and the invitation. See some familiar faces and, and, and some new ones out here. Obviously, you know, talking the issue of social inequality, right? We have a housing crisis that is uh, just primarily based on social inequality, right? And, and, and income inequality in terms of that. And, you know, we have a, a region that is based on wages that is, are very hard to, to have living wages, uh, especially in the Central Florida region. Uh, you know, we have the reality that there's a lot of people uh, that have to work two or three jobs just to maintain a standard of living. Right? And I think, you know, talking about these issues in, in kind of like the sociological viewpoint, you know, the more the concentration of power is in few hands, then you have people battling for whatever is left. I think that's what's happening in a sense, right? That we have a concentration of power and wealth in very few hands, and then the rest, uh, people are, are there to fight for uh, whatever is left out there. And I think that's where we get into the issues that I've been taking notes in terms of, you know, who, who has power? Uh, you know, sometimes the understanding of why do we have these systems of power out here? Because they tend to benefit uh, people. And again, when we chip away from kind of like that systematic viewpoint of, uh, of the structures that we have and we start just making individual uh, type of choices and saying like, you, you know, you don't work hard enough, uh, then that's where we get into the problems that we have out here in terms of that and then the erosion of institutions. Because then, you know, say like, you know, education is bad, healthcare is bad, uh, government is bad, media is bad. Uh, people will go into the streams, right? And, and I think that, that ties up with, with some of the issues that we've been talking about. But I'll let Jason also chime in into the question. Yeah, in terms of uh, where Florida ranks and the policies it does, in or it enacts in terms of income inequality and, and wealth equality, it is uh, one of the worst in the country by far. So there's an organization called the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy that ranks states based on the progressivity or regressivity of their tax codes, meaning essentially how much the, the very wealthy pay in tax rates compared to the, the lowest folks. Florida is the third worst in the country. In Florida, the top 1% pay a combined state and local tax rate that is more than five times less the bottom 20% of, in, of households by income. And, and these are all the result of very deliberate strategies that allow this sort of, that, that you know, uh, we, we repeal and avoid any sort of taxes that could be progressive, like on income or wealth, and we, we focus solely on consumption taxes, which fall the hardest on folks who spend a larger share, who don't have as much money because they have to spend it on everyday needs, right? And there are also other policies that are deliberately designed to make sure this wealth accumulates in just, in just a handful of, of places or allows people that have it to keep it and amass it in a way that sort of concentrates it even further. And just one quick example of that, because it happens to be something I'm looking into right now. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the major tools of tax avoidance by the super rich in this country have been the use of private family trusts, right? And these are, these are entities where you, you transfer your wealth in order to be able to pass it on to your kids or your grandkids without ever paying any sort of estate tax or gift tax, which, again, were passed back in like the standard oil days of to make sure we didn't have these kind of like feudalistic dynasties build up, right? It used to be in Florida that uh, a trust could only last for 90 years. And the idea is eventually you're going to have to pay some tax on this and eventually this wealth is going to recirculate. Last year, uh, Governor DeSantis signed a law that extended the life of trusts in Florida to 1,000 years. Well, all of these sound like pretty significant challenges to democracy. This is going to be a little bit of rapid fire. So let's say you're at a cocktail party. I'm going to start at the end and work back towards me. And you're asked the question, what do you think is the greatest threat to democracy? Not our challenges, but what actually threatens our democratic society? Dr. Rivera, I'm going to start with you and then come back towards me. I would say social inequality is at the heart of it. The, the more in, unequal we are, uh, the more likely democracy is going to erode. Uh, when people feel powerless, when they feel that their vote doesn't count because they have to struggle just to live, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a recipe for disaster. Uh, I, I would say that. All right, Jason. I would normally go with that too as well, but I'll do something different just to, to keep it going. I'm going to say um, the sort of use of state power uh, in ways that it had never been used before. And, and two places that comes up, 
We have seen a lot, I think the league cares a lot about preemptions, right? Like the, the state of Florida, which again, you know, the Florida legislature, it's a gerrymandered body, right? There's not nearly the same electoral accountability there as there is in like a county commission or a county or a city council. That we have seen more than 40 preemptions just over the last 10 years, restricting the ability of, county, of cities and counties to do anything from regulate, you know, the size of a fast food restaurant sign to who can trim a tree. And the other place we see it is in the use of authority in ways that we had never, we've never seen it before and that sort of violate what we all kind of, I thought we agreed on were norms. And the most obvious example of that most recently is the governor's essentially takeover of New College of Florida, right? The, the governor's office has explicitly said that it wants to turn New College into a Hillsdale College, which is a private Christian college in Michigan, right? And just, just sort of think about the logic of that. All of this is legal, right? The governor gets to appoint these board members, but but nobody has ever sort of tried to use their board members to dictate like down to the level of what a school is going to teach. Does this mean if a Democrat is elected governor, they're gonna turn around and, and transform it back? I mean, we are seeing though, people use their authority in ways that were, you know, we just sort of were never done before. There are some arguments that the conservative voice though on today's college campuses is stifled under all kinds of sociological um, um, standards. So. Is there, Dr. Rivera, maybe I'll ask you this question. Is there really room for, I mean, it's one thing to take over a college. I think we all agree that's terrifying. But is there a, a, a room for a conservative voice on college campuses in today's environment? You know, one of the things as a scientist, right, you have to define your variables. And I think sometimes we throw the terms, right? What is conservative values, right? And how, as an instructor, I will know that my student is conservative, liberal, whatever it is, right? And, you know, I don't know if you, if you know this, but we had an intellectual uh, ideological survey distributed to faculty here in the state of Florida. Why do you want, I mean, if, if there's so many regulations in terms of what you do as a university professor, right? There's evaluations all the time. So, you know, when we talk about those definitions of what is the conservative about, I would say, you know, all the isms that is in the, in the outside world, uh, are in the institutions of higher learning. I would, if you don't have anything else to do this afternoon, go check the websites of the leadership of any university through our states. Do they reflect our student body? Do, do the faculty reflect the makeup of our student body or the demographics of our state? So in a, in a sense, I don't, I don't know what, outside of the very extreme cases that we have that I don't know what what really people are saying. I think academics have done a poor job of setting the record straight of what is it that we do, right? In terms of, you know, if you go to my classroom, we have a syllabus, and that's a contract between you and me, and there's expectations, there's a learning goals, and if you can't catch me just saying stuff without merit, uh, there's, there's ways to regulate that. But, but, and, but they, there's, there's a, there, that's an issue that elicits a lot of uh, clicks and views and uh, sentiment out here in terms of you know this 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 is you know this the, this breeding ground of you know uh, liberals and all those type of thing and I think that's not necessarily what's happening uh, in the regulations that we have and again eroding education uh, is is a great threat uh, to democracy. All right, Justice Wells. Uh, I threat. would like I would like to revert. <clears throat> to the prior question that you ask, and what worries me the most is complacency. I believe that, there, that the, the general voting public is complacent, and that there is this feeling that we're, you know, some, it's somebody else's job to get out there and protect us. And that's not true. It's all of our job. And the only way it's going to work is not turning everything over to the courts. But the way it's going to have to work is that we individually and our families feel the responsibility to act and to get out and preserve the individualism that we have a right to expect for, and the competence we have the right to expect from our government. Uh, <clears throat> Justice Wells, what about current activities to restrict the ease or right to vote. I mean, some people say the right to vote, some people say ease to vote. What are your, what are your thoughts about what's happening in the voting process itself? 
Well, I think that we have an attack on the voting process itself that we haven't experienced in our adult lives. And my adult life goes back a long time. <laughs> but the, the fact is that we, we have built now some safeguards. We, we do have lockboxes, uh, which is a fairly new invention. The fact is, though, we've got to protect them. And we've got to protect the right for people to have access to casting a vote. And so, you know, I think we've, we fairly well understand what we're up against in voting, but we've got to act. We've got to, to build some momentum toward protecting the right to vote. In one one last question in this area, and then I'm going to go to Tali, and, and that is, there seems to be a trend in certain areas that if someone loses an election, the election is therefore rigged and not a, a full and fair election. And I want to hear your comments about that. Because well, you want us to be involved, I completely agree, but a lot of voices are saying if I lose, then the whole process is a rigged process. You know, I, I think there are some unfortunate things that happen along the way, and that concept is unfortunate for our whole democracy. You know, I, I keep hearkening back to the fact that in the year 2000, when we had Bush v. Gore going on, we all, always, for the 36 days of Bush versus, versus Gore, outside the Florida Supreme Court, we had three or 400 people protesting and carrying signs. and but we never once had a security issue. There was no feeling that someone was gonna break into the building and try to stop it. I hope we still have that. I, I'm not so sure. And that is what I'm saying is that the challenge is to build back the consensus that we have a, a democracy, but the democracy depends on each individual to protect it. Thank you. Tully. I would say focus on media literacy and propaganda. And this, of course, goes back to, to history, is in the past, people are very susceptible to propaganda during challenging times particularly. It's sort of this, I don't know whether it's part of its groupthink mentality, part of it is desperation, part of it is looking for voices in which to follow. And nowadays, particularly young people, and you look on college campuses, they don't know who the voices are, they don't have the proper role models, they don't know what to follow, and they don't know what is true and what's not true. And this goes back to social media and to all of the different areas that we were discussing relating to uh, media literacy. Basic civics, sort of going back to the basics of what makes a democracy, what causes fragility. And I always go back to the one laurel that helps all of us through the ages, and that's education. If we can look back and focus on what during these challenging times have people been able to rely on, it's always using the lessons of the past. And so the more that we're able to do that in college campuses and having uh, the ability to sit in a room with people of differing opinions, to have the basic decency and respect. Um, I work on many college campuses where the conservative students didn't feel safe to express themselves. Part of a democracy is the ability to be civil to one another. That's part of a very important core value. And we've gotten away from a lot of those basic core values in society. And so one of the most critical issues is focusing on a return to basics and helping students understand what are the sources that can be trusted. If I have one more student tell me that their source is Wikipedia and not understand the risk and the harm, we're not, we need to go back a step and make sure that they understand where their sources are and who is sharing that message. One of the uh, core principles of our democratic society is free speech. So, and we, you know, that has been a, from the founding of our constitution, a core principle. And yet I'm not sure we fully under, <coughs> excuse me, understand what we mean by free speech. So I'm gonna ask Tolly and Justice Wells to spend a minute talking about what, what is free speech? What speech can be regulated? What speech can't be regulated? Who is governed by free speech principles? Who, who is not? And how can we, as you said, Dolly, rely on, on the accuracy of the sources of our information, particularly in an era where there are alternative facts. Well, 
We've, we've got presently a, a test in the federal court in Tallahassee as to the extent of free speech on behalf of college professors uh, that are reacting against the enforcement in, uh, on their campus of a law that was passed in the last legislative session that <clears throat> attempts to regulate that. But I think that what we have, have, have in this country is probably as sound a length of historical free speech as we've had in, in democracies. And that is the fact that we have a right to assemble and we have a right to political protest, which has to be protected at all costs. And I think the courts are doing a pretty good job of protecting it thus far. All right, Tully. I think we have to distinguish between free speech, hate speech, where we draw the line, the slippery slope that exists. New Year's Eve, right in our own community, there were uh, things printed on a building, very hateful remarks. And the biggest issue became, when I was asked to make a statement, well, it's somebody's free speech. Well, your free speech does not infringe on somebody else's rights. And so a very clear understanding of what is hate speech, what is harmful, and once again, I focus on this, understanding the detriment of hate speech and what it can lead to means that we do have to put our foot down and speak out, and this is where I talk about the media. We need media outlets to stand up, and this did happen. And most importantly, when there's an act against one minority group, it's critical that other minority groups stand up and say, that's not tolerated. So that we don't become siloed in our own groups. We as a community, as a society, globally say, we don't tolerate that. So when any act of hatred occurs and somebody says, well, that's free speech, no. If you are using your free speech to violate other people's human rights, it is no longer free speech. And everybody needs to stand up against that. So Brandeis and Holmes both talked about the, the speech that needs the greatest amount of prote uh, protection is the speech that disturbs other people. In other words, speech that is not offensive, speech that everyone agrees with, that's easy. It's the speech that disturbs people that needs protection. And how do we balance that against hate speech? And what should be the balance? Well, I think that there has to be lines drawn in every human endeavor. And the Supreme Court of uh, the United States long ago said that your freedom to swing uh, ends at the tip of my nose. And I think that's, that's where the essence of the problem is, is that we have, we have to insist upon uh, limitations on things that are going to cause damage to the body politic and to other individuals like in Nazi Germany and, and that type of speech. But we have to have lines drawn and they have to be drawn with care and wisdom so that we are not over restrictive of the right to make statements that to some would seem rather obnoxious. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. I'm gonna to go to the other end of the table. So. We hear a lot of conversation about parental choice when it comes to immunizations, masking, um, admission to school, but apparently not when it comes to gender identification or the appropriate books that children can read. So, Dr. Rivera, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about this dichotomy of parental choice in one area and not in another area, particularly when it pertains to schools. Yeah, I think, you know, this is sort of the process of the lack of respect that we've gotten for experts, right? Uh, being an expert right now is such a curse word, right? <laughs> and we're in the area of you know, social media that allows a platform for people to express themselves, but that doesn't make you an expert whatsoever. Uh, doing a Google search is not research. Um, and I sometimes think it's the intellectual dishonesty on both the left and the right, that when you do it, it's right, when you do it on the other side, it's wrong. And, you know, at the end of it, that's why we have the institutions that we have, in terms of the educational institutions that we have, the experts that we have, right? And I think this, that's, that's where we get into, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's a sketchy time when, you know, we make these value judgments on individuals and groups of people without the adequate information and just succumbing to public pressure. Uh, never 
I'm not a fan of banning books or you know, curriculum, just not necessarily based on any uh, facts whatsoever. Um, obviously, there's, there's a sector of the population and, and, and you know, obviously I believe in evolution of thought uh, in terms of the issues that we have and, and, and some of the, the our, our teenagers and, and, and kids that are dealing with, with issues that were not accounted for in the past and now we have those tools to account for and now we have this resistance uh, that is, 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 is primarily based on political gain and I wish we can, again, go back to the scientific basis, go to the rational thought that we have and have those discussions out here, but also do no harm. And I think that's what should be the way we do our policies is to make sure that we are not harming people uh, with the policies that we put out there or the speech that we put out there. Jason, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, ask the question again. Uh, the question was, there, there apparently is parental choice in some areas you know, masking, immunizations, but we don't trust parents to choose what gender identification their own children uh, can pursue or uh, what books are necessarily good for them to read or harmful for them to read. And so I was asking about your impression about that dichotomy. Yeah, I think uh, what you're seeing is, is everything is being driven by an ideolo ideology of convenience rather than any sort of consistent ideology. It's sort of whatever, you know, any, any public policy issue is going to involve the balance of some sort of rights and some sort of, you know, competing philosophies and stuff. So it's very easy to pick whichever one you need to advance the, the goal you're trying to achieve. And so that's why you'll see parental rights invoked in certain cases when it's something they want to stop, like the teaching of, of institutional racism, but not in other areas. And one of the ways, uh, one of the things I'll just, one quick anecdote that always sort of crystallized this for me, right, is uh, the governor has obviously, this has been a, a huge topic of discussion, is the governor's sort of involvement hands-on in higher education in the way uh, he has led the state uh, more deeply into making things like curriculum decisions and, and sort of trying to get into speech. You know, uh, shortly after he was elected, elected to office, he was asked about the problem of free speech on college campuses and intellectual diversity. And he said he didn't think that was a problem at all, right? This is like three years ago, right? This, is, this has become a problem because he realizes it's something that the, the base of voters he is trying to reach, uh, they care about, they perceive to be a problem. So he's finding ways to make it a problem. It's not that none of these things, this is why you end up with what you're describing in Sometimes they care about a certain right, and other times they care about a different right. And it happens on both sides in certain cases, but it is, it is particularly on the right wing where there has been a more sophisticated development of right wing media outlets and sort of media echo chambers. It has become a much more, consi uh, much more significant issue on that side. All right. Um, I think we're going to end with this question. I'm going to give everybody on the panel an opportunity to respond to it. But... Uh, if you look back historically, it was pretty rough and tumble when the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists first were pursuing presidential power. Then we had a civil war. We had violence on the floor of the Senate. Um, and so my question is, is political division in this country the worst that it has ever been? Does it pose a threat to democracy? Are we at the nadir in terms of political division? Or have we had worse political division in this country, and what should we do about the current state of political disagreement in our country? I'll start in the middle with you, Jason, and I'll work out, and then I'll come back to this end. So you get that one first. Well, I'm going to mostly defer to the, the sort of historical experts in terms of what's worse. I mean, we, we had a revolutionary war and a civil war, so I'm going to say it's probably not the worst it's ever been. Um, I don't at all believe we are uh, at the, the nadir of it right now. Um, I think um, everything we see is just continued pushing of the, a lot of the problems and the systematic challenges we've had here. We're, uh, we are very likely to, to Justice as Wells' conversation, we are very likely to see a Florida Supreme Court is about to rule that the right to privacy does not protect the right to abortion, right? We are going, we are going down that road, so we're gonna see how reactions happen to that. Um, yeah, I, I foresee it getting worse. I, you know, I'll leave it to, to folks that have a much broader historical perspective about. Very good, Dr. Cool. Rivera. No, I, I, I sort of agree in, in, in a sense, and, and you know, we, we look at our historical past, right? Uh, we're, we're not that far removed, 50, 60 years, that probably I could have been in this room with you folks out here uh, in terms of that, because there was three uh, 
division of, of people by race, uh, you know, and, and, we, and we know that, you know, the right to vote for women uh, wasn't, wasn't given, wasn't written in the Constitution. So there's been some advantages out there. I think the big lesson here is not necessarily if it's better or worse, is that it needs protection. And I think we have become a little complacent that, you know, we, fight, we, we, we passed a Civil Rights Act and that was it, let's move on, let's, do, let's go to the other thing. And I think that the, the, the issue of democracy is a, is a, is a very new experiment, uh, in a sense. And we're still learning and we continue to learn. But we have to be vigilant and continue to fight what, what you believe in in terms of, you know, these democratic values. And, and so that premise of, 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 you know, that democracy, the premise of democracy is that, you know, people are going to voluntarily walk away from power uh, and, and, and succumb to the will of the people. And I think we, we need to really, really continue to understand that and make sure that it continues to happen. My thought about it is that we certainly have experienced periods in our lifetimes which have been extreme. I remember the impeach Earl Warren signs driving from here to the ball game in Gainesville that broke out after Brown versus Board of Education. And that and all of the the problems we had in integrating schools in, in this state as well as across other states in the South. And, and so we've had these problems. The, the, the thing, though, that is concerning to me now is the, the direct attack on the, the rights to vote generally in the population. We've had those in, in, that have been in the in, in racial connotations, but now we have it across the entire uh, scene, and we have got to pay attention to it. Um, Charlie, before we leave, I wonder if you can just give me your visceral reaction and then your intellectual reaction to January 6th and, it, and what it means for democracy. Well, my visceral reaction was it scared hell out of me because I uh, worked in some of those bills. And I worked at the Justice Department uh, and used to go down to the Capitol. But the, and, and the thing that is the, the most concerning is that there are governmental officials that still today are trying to convince us that it was a minimal thing. It wasn't a minimal thing. It was a serious thing, which we have to take very seriously that we have that type have to mount a defense against that type of anarchy, which is being promoted by some political forces. Thank you. Tully. I don't think that it's uh, irreversible, I would say. I think these are challenging times, and I think we know that these are challenging times, but I think that um, we're heading for some dark times, and the only thing that can change that and reverse that is going to be us being vigilant in explaining how fragile democracy is and using lessons of the past and educating. That's the, the only thing that's going to keep us in a, in a different direction. Um, I wonder if I can appeal to the audience to join me in thanking our speakers for their thoughts on these topics. <laughs> There, there, is, there is so much, to, hold on, before you do that, there is so much to cover, there's so much to cover that we could be here for hours, uh, and so we kind of just scratched the surface, much like asking someone to cover two decades of German history in five minutes, but we're going to open the floor to questions from the audience, so if you have a question, if you'd go up to the microphone and... Uh, you can pose it to the panelists as a group, or you can pick an individual panelist. And your name and members only in one question. Those are the rules. Thank you, Pat. <clears throat> Charlie Williams, <coughs> League member. <clears throat> you know, the thread that uh, I always ask myself is, can American democracy survive a more sophisticated propaganda? And that's something we haven't seen before. In courts, your honors, you have a penalty if you lie. It's called perjury. But on the free speech side, we really don't have anything. Media literacy is critical. If you read the New York Times yesterday, the country of Finland just instituted with eighth graders a media literacy program where they take apart propaganda. Frankly, I need that class because I've been tricked before. 
And it's great that our young people are beginning to look at it with smarter eyes, but we all need it. Uh, you know, Jason, your colleague Mary Ellen Kloss just totaled up 17 million in lawsuits that taxpayers have paid against the governor's culture wars. Uh, your Honor, um, you know, uh, they changed the law on vote by mail, so now you all expired in 2022. You have to renew to get that vote by mail coming up for this year forward. So what guardrails could we, or what are you thinking about to protect us on this side of free speech? Well, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Like, I'll talk about it from, from sort of the media, sort of media expertise or, or sort of like interpreting media or how to sophisticated read media side. It's a tricky question, right? Like one of the things you've seen countries do, um, I think this happened recently in Canada, is, is create sort of like essentially subsidy programs to try and, um, to try and support uh, legitimate sort of independent longstanding media and in a ways to sort of, you know, it's the public broadcast kind of model except it's more explicit government support. But obviously that that's really problematic too in that you don't necessarily want your independent media reliant on you know, the Florida legislature for funding, right? So, um, you know, it's a great question. I think uh, teaching in very early ages people how to sort of think critically about what they read, how to, how to look at sources, how, do I, how to distinguish between what is opinion and what is fact. You know, I think those are all sort of important, but... Um, I'm not aware of any easy answer to any of this. If I could kick in on the voting area for just a moment. When I was a county judge, I had the chance to serve as chair of the um, um, uh, canvassing board. Thanks, I had a blank there for a minute. I, I know everybody's busy, but if you ever have an opportunity to watch Bill Cowell's office at work and you have any questions about the sanctity of the vote, that's an eye-opening experience. And I think that it would reaffirm your confidence in how uh, saying how our votes are protected and accurately counted. So that's one thing I would encourage people to do. It takes a little bit of time, but if you can get down there and do it. All right, next question. Hi, Rachel Deming. Uh, there has been some question about the independence of particularly the Florida Supreme Court due to the number of appointments that the current governor has made. I guess, Justice Wells, I would start with you, but invite comment. What do you think about the process, the appointment process that we currently have in Florida, and is there any way that you would suggest changes? Well, I think that the appointment process is the best that we have been able to come up with. It's got its problems, and but it, one of the things uh, that we discovered in Florida was when we had direct elections where everybody could vote, there was very little interest and very little knowledge about who was running for those offices. So we went to a merit panel selection of at least appellate judges, and I think, but it's like everything else. It's only going to work as, as well as we demand that it work. And that's everybody's responsibility to educate themselves, their families, and their friends on who is doing what in the judiciary. And believe me, there is no m more powerful position in government than a local circuit judge in, in Florida because they have really sort of unreviewable power. So it's incumbent upon us to know who that is. If I can kick into one thing, um, full disclosure, I was appointed to the circuit bench by Governor Jeb Bush, but, but one thing he did that disappointed me was, it used to be that the nominating committees for judges were made up of three appointees by the governor, three appointees from the Florida Bar, and then they would appoint three lay people. Governor Bush changed that to the governor makes all the appointments. And therefore, whoever the governor sort of is hoping will get the appointment is kind of communicated to that group. I think one of the safeguards was if the nominating committees were constituted, they were the way they were when Lawton Childs was governor and Ruben Askew created those nominating committees, there would be a sort of a more objective list of candidates that went to the governor and that would improve the system. Yeah, can I jump in there too real quick because this touches on, we've talked about how the boundaries of authority are getting pushed in ways that 
weren't intended. What you're alluding to, I think, is the, the JNC process. Like, to get on the Supreme Court, you have to first be nominated by this, this uh, a panel called the Judicial Nominating Commission. And initially, that was structured in such a way, like you described, that it was a, a joint process between the governor and the Florida Bar. Each got, got appointees, and then those appointees got, got together and picked another set of appointees. Jeb changed it. It became, uh, I believe, he gets five of the nine appointees now in the Florida Bar, and then he gets to choose four more, but it has to be nominations from the Florida Bar. That, that sort of consolidated the governor's power more. But then what we saw under, and this was under Rick Scott, is for the first time, he started rejecting entire nomination slates provided by the Florida Bar. And he would make the Florida Bar continue to send him JNC nominees until he got the ones he wanted. And it's just another way, nobody had ever done that before. It's not that you couldn't. And in fact, it was, uh, I remember writing a story about it for a magazine. Nobody was, everybody was sort of puzzled what the remedy of it was, and they didn't know, so they just kept sending him more, right? And he got what he wanted. And it's just another sort of example of how part of the challenge we're seeing is people using their, their power in ways that, you know, we all sort of accepted you wouldn't do in the past. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Eugene Staccato. Uh, this league, uh, as a body, championed fair districts a decade ago. And the basis of our, our government is a fair district. But those districts are drawn by partisans. And should we, as Floridians, create a, a constitutional amendment to create a nonpartisan committee to apply the laws and the Constitution to create fair districts? I think theoretically that works. The problem that we always experience with these changes is who is going to administer the changes and how they're going to be put into effect. Now, I, I, I thought that the old system was a better safeguard than what we presently have, but it still comes back to the fact that we all have to pay attention to who is in the appointing positions, because that's where the action is. All right, in the interest of time, last question from the audience, or we would keep you here till the sunset. So whoever wants to be bold enough to wrestle that mic. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll, I moved here from Minnesota um, a year ago. Tell us your name, please. Marlis Harris. Thank and, you. And uh, I'm a member. Um, what I want to know is, uh, do you think Florida is now a democracy. I know that people voted, but you really have, it seems like one man rule. And um, so that's my question, quick answer. From... <laughs> well, my answer is yes, Florida is still a democracy, but a democracy that's under pressure. And that pressure can only be relieved by groups like this really taking up the, the challenge to protect it. Now, there are certain built-in safeguards that ultimately I think will work to protect our democracy in Florida, but there is a lot of pressure on it. And I, I do applaud the Sentinel and the news media in general, because they have, have placed a focus on it. Um, on behalf of the panelists, and allow me to take the floor for a moment and thank the league. Uh, we heard at the beginning of this about a constitutional republic that lost its power and it was ev it evaporated and a dictator came to power. These kinds of events where we have these kinds of conversations are critical to a functioning democracy. There is a debate about whether these are challenges to democracy or threats to democracy. I would say there are more challenges provided an organization like yours continues to have these kind of events. So I'm gonna ask that you give yourself a round of applause for sponsoring this event. Thank you. All right, now I wanna, I wanna Yield the microphone to who? Someone, I know. Key Rembo. Lee Rembo. Lee, I'm sorry, apologize. Lee, thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the League, I'd like to thank our distinguished panel of 
speakers. You've been marvelous. And <laughs> to thank Cuisineers for a wonderful lunch. I enjoyed every morsel. <laughs> I am Lee Rambo Kemp, the chair of the Fund Development Committee here for the League, and I would also like to thank all of you who have supported the League, especially in our early days of doing fundraising. So if you haven't yet donated, we have envelopes on the table. <laughs> this powerful presentation brings so much to mind. And I came across a quote by Reinhold Niebuhr, a man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, but the inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. You really struck a chord with the League's call to action. We believe <clears throat> democracy works best when it works for all. Among the many takeaways were three calls to action, which I think resonate so powerfully with our mission, and that is to empower voters and to defend democracy. One, the importance of getting out the vote in Central Florida, that will always remain our primary mission finding new ways to appeal to the younger voter. Now the largest voting block in the US is number two. And last, what FDR called the real safeguard to democracy, civic education. Those are all powerful things that we put so much behind every day, every year. So thank you for helping us by your being members and supporters to be a part of what we do. To get more information on the drift, I'll call it drift, to autocracy and the erosion of human rights, we suggest you visit the website for the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center of Florida and look for the video on the erosion of human rights from the Holocaust to the present. And if you enjoyed being a part of today's discussion, be sure to come to next month's Hot Topics. <laughs> That's going to be on February 8th, which is also February's Black History Month. And always one of our most popular events, the topic will be about black resistance, advocating for self-determination. The presentation will be brought to you in partnership with the Central Florida's Dorothy Turner Johnson branch of ASALA, the National Association for the Study of American Life and History. It's a powerful group. I just joined it. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, move on to announcements and reminders. Um, and I want to say this before I forget it. We actually are participating in uh, a Martin Luther King Day event in Eatonville on Saturday and we are short two volunteers. So members, if you have a couple of hours, please go to our website and sign up for the day. If you have not already done so, please also consider signing the petition which is circulating at this table over here for the right to clean water. That's something that's important for all of us. Our new member orientation, for those of you who are new to the League, will be held via Zoom on Tuesday, January 17th at 6.30 p.m. Please join us. It's always fun. Our membership program planning meeting, always very exciting, is going to be Saturday, January 28th from 9 to 12 at the Winter Park Community Center at the corner of uh, New England Avenue and Pennsylvania. So, Hope to see all of you there. And if you have not had a chance to visit with our
platinum sponsor, Climate First Bank. Please stop by their table as you leave. They would love to see you and say hello. If you are a guest today, we would love to have you join us as a member. And the QR codes that are on the slide are active links to our join page on our league website, so you can flash the camera there. And if there are no further announcements, we are adjourned, and thank you for joining us.